Hi, hello, namaskar. This is your host Sarang, and welcome to One Story at a Time. In this podcast, we have Mr. Ashish Sarawagi, who is an angel investor, entrepreneur, and has twenty years of experience in the corporate. Also, he is an IIM Lucknow alum. Hello, Ashish. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Sarang, uh, for having me on the show. Yeah, I look forward to. The Thank discussion. you so much. Definitely. Is it, is it your first time doing a podcast of this sort? Yes, I think this is my first one, so all the more special for me as well. Yep, yep. Okay, I'm excited <laughs> since this is your first. Okay, okay. So let's uh, sort of talk about your journey in IIM Lucknow and your corporate experience because when you know there is a stigma of IIM stamps, you know, in India. So if you are from IIM, you are you know like well respected and you know you are sort of uh, you know. IIM people are assumed to have a lot of knowledge and experience. So tell us more about your IIM Lucknow experience. Okay. So basically, I jumped into IIM Lucknow straight after my BCom. You know, which was again one of its kind because IIMs typically attract people with over two to three years of experience, and I was straight out of college into MBA at IIM Lucknow. And till the time I come from Calcutta and. till the time you are in college you are more of you know uh, you are more uh, guarded by your family so going into lucknow with 240 other batchmates it was an entirely different experience a very very different cultural shock and right you always tend to be one of the best in your college days or school days at least i was amongst the best and therein you realize that everybody who is there comes with a certain pedigree so it Can was I... absolutely a cultural shock in the beginning and then you slowly tend to Uh, adjust with people, network with people. So the couple couple of years at IIM were very very, I would say very very satisfying from a personal perspective because it mm. definitely grows everybody as an individual. It's not just the what you study inside the classroom, but it's also about what you study outside the class because there's so many projects assignments. It's more about Correct. learning how to handle the pressure. It's more about building your network in terms of the. classmates you have the juniors the right. seniors so it's very much about networking and that is something which lasts you over your lifetime so those two two years uh, you know were very very eventful in a positive way from a personal perspective uh, after i completed my mba the first four years you know and that that to remember bcom plus mba finance and marketing yeah. uh, uh, you know after the first four years i worked in the IT industry, straight away from commerce to IT. So <laughs> worked for <four> years <laughs> with a couple of a uh, couple of IT companies. Spent the last time overseas. Mm. Uh, then uh, you know got an opportunity with uh, City, which I was lucky. So right. moved from IT to City Bank. Got in got into a product role. Spent there about five years. It was a mix of product and sales. and then once i finished that i then spent almost 11 years at bank of america which i think was one of the finest over my life span so far I made a lot right. of good friends over there so uh, during my 11 years at bank of america i did multiple roles out there uh, you know across uh, uh, transaction banking across corporate banking leading some managing some of the biggest names for the bank in the country the who's who you can uh, talk about it lots of different roles lot of different assignments lot of different challenges right i think that really uh, you know helped me enhance uh, enhance me professionally and personally and after mm-hmm. having spent for after having spent 20 years in the corporate world you know uh, do remember the fact that i also come from a marwadi business family and i was always okay. the only one both from my paternal and maternal side who was in the service side so somewhere Achha. there was always a calling in life yes khud ka kuch karna hai you know being a maru so i think covid accelerated that calling in uh, life and uh, you know egged on by the support from my family all of us are very much fed were are fed on shark tank so you know Some um, idea came to the mind, and we decided, boss. After twenty years of working, uh, you have made a name for yourself. You have a certain experience. You have a certain degree of financial cushion, also, if I may say. So, if now you cannot take the plunge, then when? And that's how my uh, entrepreneurship journey started. 
once mm. the entrepreneurship journey started i was like boss while i run for my business you know there should be others also who should be running for me so i thought why not get into angel investing also given that you have the cushion so uh, started doing a little bit of angel investing also on the side so i made investments in a few companies so far and i look forward to growing that portfolio in the coming days right so bob i think there was a bit of a lag i think i missed the last part but but anyway i mean uh i think um, you know i have spoken to a couple of iim graduates and uh, you know most of them said the same thing uh, you know uh, it it is not about the curriculum it is not about what you study in iim right it is all about the contacts that you make and you know i really believe in this philosophy of your network is your net worth right and i think colleges like iits and iim gives you a huge scope to network and you know and most of these iitians and iims they kind of are the cream layer of corporate right so i i mean i can imagine the kind of networks and connections that you have from iim so uh, let's uh, let's talk more about your investing journey right so i mean uh, i'm sure once you were in banking you would have heard about all these investments startup you know all those things so did it kind of impact you to start did it kind of influence you or how did your investing journey start see if you are a banker in india or anywhere else uh, in a regulated country typically there are restrictions on bankers in terms of where they can invest when i talk about restrictions mm. it is around uh, whether you can trade in the stock market or not whether it is same country different country you know because very often what happens is uh, you are uh, you uh, you manage the corporate banking for particular companies and you have insider trade information so correct okay. and that is prohibited right so if you want to deal in any stock shares or do any angel investing there is a ton of approval which is required okay mm. so typically in the time i was within the bank the options to invest were pretty limited uh, you know so it was more of mutual fund it was more of real estate maybe a little bit of gold uh, uh, and a few other revenues but directly dealing in shares stocks angel investing was a little bit of challenging because you did not want to go through the hassle of taking multiple approvals for every entry and exit as was the case correct mm-hmm. so once i got out uh, you know all of the shackles if i may call it uh, from the bank here from the banking sector then it was like you know you being able to invest where you believe in so uh, right. you know when you look at the options available so you know uh, so a couple of obvious options are the stock markets uh, which have been doing phenomenally well over the last decade or two Uh, oh. apart from that if you want to explore what are the other options you know you could either look at crypto you could either look at angel investing and given the way the startup culture is booming in the country india is almost mm-hmm. number 3 as far as the number of new startups is coming up you are looking at the number of new unicorns which are coming up and there are multiple right. more expected to come up by 2025 right so there are a number of growth opportunities if you invest in the uh, in the right companies as i heard somebody say you know so you have to find out the correct sweet corns and the baby corns of today to become the unicorns of tomorrow yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea is to see where do i got the sweet corns and baby corns yeah mm. okay great so i think you've got about three sweet corns right so far yes so far okay so uh i believe that uh, correct me if i am wrong angel investors get in very early with the startups right yes okay so when uh, you know there is no proof of business uh, i am not saying a proof of product or anything proof of business what is that what are those few things that angel investors look in those startups before they invest i think the most important asset which i as a angel investor look at is the founder itself you know mm-hmm. obviously if i get a 
warm reference of the founder that's like yeah. uh, uh, that's that's a best case scenario because i have a warm connect i i have a certain comfort with respect to the pedigree and the experience of the person you know right so it's very very important that when founders reach out either it's better that they come out through a connect because it because it helps you establish a comfort right okay. so that is number one number mm-hmm. two is i think depending from investor to investor also there are certain industries where you feel comfortable and there are certain industries where you may not feel comfortable so it's also very important to see what is the kind of industry the founder comes to you with and whether you have a mm-hmm. certain experience or not or experience in that or not and whether you, is there any way you will be able to help the founder with that right if there is a industry in which you have no clue then probably i might to uh, well stay away from it but if there is something i can be a strategic investor that is what it would interest me i think one very important point i would like to add over there is at least over the last 3 to 4 months that i have been doing angel investing one of the common pitfalls that i find is i see a linkedin request uh, if i accept it within a minute there is a funding request which mm-hmm. i think is a absolute no no uh, and it just spoils your chances if you are looking okay. to raise funding it has to be a six month effort and not a one week or a one month effort you know ultimately if you meet somebody unknown on the street and if he asks you for 1000 bucks will you give it and here in you are talking about much larger amounts okay. so i think uh, and this is this happens all the time every week i get five to 10 messages like these yeah so mm-hmm. i think all of us have to be a become a little bit more smarter in terms of how do we build our network network not just with the vcs and the angel investors but also amongst the Uh, founder community there are a right. lot of uh, wonderful communities out there on a pan india basis run by multiple people become a part of that learn from your co-founders and in, i am also doing that because uh, in today's scenario i am wearing twin hats one of a founder okay. one of a investor investor uh, so i can appreciate both the sides uh, you know mm. so uh, my my thought process is, as you said network is net worth put your energies at least 20 to 30% time over a 6 month over a 12 month span to build those networks by getting into some mm-hmm. of these and not all of these are paid many of these are run by uh, senior mentors as well so uh, do a little bit of homework around that and try to build your network which in turn will open more doors for you that's what i would say Okay. So you you spoke about uh, looking at the founder, right? But are there no. any traits that you specifically look at the founder, like any characters or features or anything like that you expect from a founder? See, typically from a business perspective, it's at a very very nascent stage. The business is yet to be proven. So what I look okay. at is number one. uh what is the sort of experience the founder has whether he has experience in the same industry or if he is a very very young guy what is the sort of education he has and what is the sort of team he has with him team could be in terms of co-founders as well because you could still be uh, setting up your team that is number 1 number 2 mm. is how organized or structured the person at the other end is i'll give you an example the other day somebody reached out to me okay uh on linkedin uh, request and then pitch a uh, funding request then okay. i asked him for a pitch deck what what i got was a word document i was like at least i deserve a pitch deck if you want me to look at it so the content is the same uh, you know so when you uh, that was one case another case uh, was when the person fixes up a time and for- forgets to attend it these are like some of the basics so i think as a founder you need to be a little bit more organized and you need to be able to tell your story in 30 to 60 seconds of what you want to mm-hmm. achieve the third thing right. which also is very important to me is apart from the team how structured the person is in terms of the uh, kind of budget which the person has you know because one of mm-hmm. the things very often when i find is how much money have you put in or what is the sort of money you will need people just think about cost of building the product okay but i can tell you for a fact when you have to 
manage your finances, cost of building a product is only 60 to 70 percent of your overall cost. There will be cost mm-hmm. for your legal things. There will be cost for your uh, support requirements. There will be costs around managing your compliances, whether it is a CA, CS, or somebody else. So you have to okay. take a step back and start thinking holistically in terms of how will you manage mm-hmm. the budget because ultimately whatever business you are in if the cash flow dries up net net you are dead correct so those are some of the things which i look out for yeah okay okay super so it's basically how organized a founder is and the team the budget and most importantly i guess it is the storytelling that convinces you to invest in a founder right okay so yes um, and most importantly, as I said, just repeating that point is what is the sort of network you have or, you know, is there, are there common references? Because that helps a lot. Okay. 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 Got it. And uh, this one more follow-up question to this. When is a startup really ready to raise funds? Because everybody is in an investing race as well as a raising race. So everybody wants to raise funds as quickly as possible and investors don't want to miss out on opportunities. So what is your thought on this? When is a startup really ready to raise funds? That's a million dollar question. And I hope somebody had the (laughs) total answer to that. (laughs) But if I have to put my two cents to that, number one is, see, okay. Number one, what you have to factor in is, whether you are a first time founder, whether you are a repeat founder, because the yardstick for measuring are different for founders who have successfully exited in the past vis-a-vis the founders who are setting it up for the first time. Right. Right. So if you talk about the founders who are setting it up for the first time, my take on that will be number one, you have your MVP ready. Number two is the fact that you have a basic team in place. When I talk about a team, it is in terms of not just your full-time employees, it could be outsourced as well, but have some sort of a team ready in place because right. alone you can only do as much. Uh, so that would be the uh, second thing. And third thing, uh, obviously it appeals if you have some traction or if you have done some sort of a UAT with a kind of customer base which you want to target. So those would be the three parameters what I would think you should look at and definitely one and two, uh, you know, become the most important criteria. Okay, got it. Super. Right. Uh, On the the other hand, on the other hand, uh, I I was actually going through an article which said uh, bootstrapping is the essence of entrepreneurship. Right. So. What what do you what do you think? Bootstrapping is that good, or is it is, is raising funds good, or does it depend on the startup or the situation? What is your thought on? That? I think it's specific from business to business, and also with respect to the mindset of the entrepreneur in terms of how fast you want to grow. Right. Obviously, there are some businesses which have which will have a higher gestation period or which will be more capital intensive as compared to the other businesses. So there is no one shoe which which fits everybody. But if you have some sort of a business wherein there is high scalability and the scalability and the success will also be a function of how fast you are able to scale up, then obviously capital becomes important. And in case if you don't have that uh, cushion with you, you will need to look at uh, external sources, right? Nowadays, one of the things that you will hear very often in the market is accelerate to fail, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea over here is there are some businesses in which speed is the key, right? Look at, for example, the TV technology, how the technology is changing almost every couple of years, right? So a technology today may not be relevant after three years. So you have to think about what is the sort of business you have, how fast you need to be able to have, what should be your go to your go to market strategy, how fast you need to execute it, what is the kind of resources you need. And when you talk about resources, it is in terms of finance, it is in in terms of the people that you need to have in the team, it is in terms of the marketing partners, the channel partners, what you need to have. 
So do you have the wherewithal to do it by yourself? That will mm-hmm. probably give an answer to your question. But there's no why. Uh, right. There's no blanket answer for that. Understood. So so basically, it depends on the situation. Depends on how fast the startup has to grow and so on. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also, what you have to be very cautious about is how is your cash flow position like? How far do you mm-hmm. have the runway? in whichever stage of the business you are you need to be you need to ensure that you have runway of about 12 to 18 months if you don't have 12 to 18 months then probably uh, it's a recipe for disaster yeah so mm. before you spend your money before you spend your time try to think about the sort of runway you have or how will you create that runway okay super wonderful okay so you actually mentioned uh, about pitch deck a couple of times So uh, when you, I yeah. mean, and one way to approach angel investors is through pitch decks, right? So is there anything in particular that you look in those pitch decks? There are a few. Th- there are some. Uh, there are a few things what you one needs to look at in the pitch deck. Number one is what is the sort of, what is the story you are trying to say? What is your mm-hmm. USP as compared to the competition? uh you know in terms of what you want to say yeah. how will you monetize your idea what is the scalability of your idea so all these are things which need to come out number one number two in addition to talking about your business given that your business is at a nascent stage i think people often miss talking about themselves because ultimately mm-hmm. the biggest comfort is on the individual and not anybody else so you need to right. talk a little bit more about yourself as well as the team that is working along with you and uh, you know just for reference there are wonderful links on the uh, uh, internet wherein mm-hmm. what are some of the formats you should follow uh, for a pitch deck it's laid out in uh, detail whether you look at the y combinator website there are wonderful links which talk about how can you make it a slide by slide what are the parameters you should cover and similarly other places as well so i think people right. who spend a little bit more time in terms of doing a good job because ultimately if i don't like your pitch deck you will not even get a second hearing exactly exactly even though the product or the problem that they are trying to solve is good if the pitch deck is not good i mean there's no point in you know <laughs> see think of it the other way you might have a very good yeah. idea but ultimately if 20 people are approaching me on a weekly basis or on a daily basis would you have the time to go through each one of them mm-hmm. would you have the time to go through one hour with everybody ultimately exactly. what captures your attention right it's all about that correct correct as we call it the elevator pitch in one minute can you convince mm-hmm. me that you are the right person for me right so it's so pitch deck is not the only parameter but it's a important parameter for you to get shortlisted Correct. I agree. Totally agree with that. Okay, and uh, one more thing is that uh, do you have like a, a sector specific return that you expect? Okay, now let's say if you are investing in an IT company, do you expect certain amount of return? So tell us more about the returns part from an investor perspective. i might sound greedy over here but typically okay. when you are investing when you are a angel investor and you invest in a startup you are looking at a 2x 3x 4x return in a span of 1 to 2 to 3 years right you are not talking about mm. 10 20 30% returns for that right. i would have my stock market to look at i would have the fds to look at i would have the mutual funds to look at maybe even the real estate yeah. right so Makes that's sense. number 1 yeah. so number uh, the second thing over here is very old. see returns is not always in terms of the monetary side of it okay people mm. also have to start thinking in terms of how can they create value versus only valuation and that is something which i think people always uh, you know confuse themselves valuation versus value if you create value mm. for the business or for the customer valuation will automatically follow it's not the other way around so uh, when we look at a business the idea over there is okay if you are selling a x product or service what is the sort of traction you are likely to achieve over the next 6 months 12 months 18 months there should be a clear cut out plan you know which should be milestone based mm-hmm. and 
equally important is the fa fact that if you talk about acquiring 1 million customers in 6 months or 12 months, what is your go-to market strategy? How will you do it? Because it's very e easy to give an end statement. Okay, we will have 2 million customers. But how? That's mm. the million dollar question, right? So okay. I think those are some of the... Uh, so do I think those are some of the parameters which one needs to uh, keep, in, keep in mind while uh, uh, while reaching out to any of the investors here. Yeah. Mm. And I think it totally makes sense for angels to be greedy because you guys come in at such an early stage where the risk is significantly high. right? So if you're taking that kind of a risk, uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, you deserve to get a higher amount of return. So... Does this make sense yeah. for angel investing? Uh, that is one. Second thing, uh, what also one can look at is, see the startup mm. culture is booming in India. <coughs> Not just Correct. from a uh, founder perspective, but also from an investor perspective. More and right. more people are uh, get, uh, getting outside the comfort zone that let's look at options outside the gold, outside FDs, outside the stock markets, right? So there are these many of these angel syndicates also which are coming up across the country. So mm. if you talk, there are and there are many many of them, right? It could be the Indian Angel Networks, it could be Agility Ventures, it could be you know I could give you ten other names, and these are all right. uh, syndicates which have five hundred thousand investors behind them, and each of them put mm. in one lakh, two lakhs, which is the starting amount. Uh, you know. Okay. So I think while the founders, while these founders look at the angel investors by themselves, but there are many such mm. syndicates which do invest in early seed. So you should not lose sight of them as well. So that okay. is also something what you should look at, number one. Number two is, mm. I think LinkedIn is a fantastic tool which gives you access to lots of data sitting in the comfort of your uh, home or office right so okay. if you if you really want to reach out the reach out to the investors spend time in uh, finding out who are the investors what is their investment thesis whether they come in a pre-seed round seed round series a where are they coming up and equally mm -hmm. important is the fact that once you find out whether their stage matches with yours or not also if there are any industries which they focus on so if you can look at those x uh, x and y parameters your life will be a little bit more smoother as compared to uh, otherwise is what I feel. Correct. I agree. You know, knowing the background of the investor is also pretty important because once you start communicating with them, you know, through a common you know, personal ground, I think, you know, uh, the connection kind of deepens, right? And, you know, there's a... Uh, it, it's it's more than an investor founder relationship after that once you have a common ground right you you have hit the nail on the head you know and how does this relationship grow you know you have to think of ways how do you make this grow obviously you may not have direct access all the time but think mm. of ways in terms of let's say talk about linkedin for example okay right can you look at expressing your thoughts maybe related to your business or even something else you know so on a constant mm. basis that could be one parameter Number two, if okay. you are following many of these investors, uh, many of them are very, very active uh, on social media. Mm. So if there is an article, can you share your thoughts? You know, it will show your it will show your mindset, and it will give you some visibility right. somewhere or the other, depending on what is the sort of content you provide to that. Right. So the, uh, so uh, so create your own uh, persona, create your own visibility as well on social media is number one. And number mm. two, as I said earlier. Put a very high focus in terms of build, uh, getting into communities with other founders. You know, mm. it could be via. Uh, there are, as I said, there are a number of these uh, free communities as well. You get to ne network with multiple other founders. So if you are able to get into that uh, uh, community, automatically using uh, getting uh, getting referrals will be far easier for you, and you get to learn from other people. When I talk about mm. to learn from other people, it's not just about the fundraise, you know. I'll give you a simple example. Till, uh, for almost all the founders, digital marketing is a very, very big thing, right? Mm. Till the time I was in the banking world for the different industry, digital marketing was more about Instagram management, Facebook management and so Correct. on. 
but now having spent uh, almost close to a year there is so much to digital marketing there is a separate team looking at seo there is a separate team looking at performance marketing there is a separate team looking at the social media handles and there are dozen yeah. other avenues also within the digital marketing so uh, if you are connected to a proper founder community you will get access mm-hmm. in terms of okay for a from a startup perspective which is a good friendly digital marketing agency which are the lawyers you can okay. reach out to because you will need your msas you will need your wonder contracts and so on so okay. that will help you to avoid spending a lot of time on the admin stuff and learning from mm-hmm. the mistakes of others which could help to fast track your success so uh, reemphasizing that focus 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 on creating network not just with the vcs and the angel investors they are more of a trickle down impact focus with your mm-hmm. uh, uh pfs you know and the entrepreneurs fraternity got it okay so moving on to the last question of the investing part uh, a lot of people are saying that there is going to be a recession and this recession is going to be bigger than 2008 following that there is also going to be an investment winter for startups so what is your comment on this do you think there is going to be an investment winter for startups See, I think the objective should be more to focus on what you can do, right? Mm-hmm. Ultimately, if you have started a started your startup, you have started with the best of intentions, and given the fact that we are talking here more about the early stage founders, okay, wherein mm-hmm. the investments are more likely to be in the range of less than a half a million dollars, you know, mm-hmm. I think the impact may not be as high as compared to what it might be for the larger ticket items. Having said mm-hmm. that. the fundamental difference which will be there is that last year for example if you just spoke about gaming you could have easily raised money mm-hmm. on a pre seed round but today uh, given the winter that you are talking about there is a little bit of a uh, more tangibility required in terms of traction Correct. in terms of the mvp around what you talk about so mm-hmm. again the threshold or the milestone at which you can raise the fund has maybe slightly got uh delayed but having said that the funding should come in to help you accelerate your growth it should not come in mm. to help you build your business right so the mindset right. also needs to change from a founders perspective in terms of why why do we need the money when do we need the money so there are challenges but uh, what i see around me if the business is good there are plenty of opportunities around It's all mm. about being in the right place at the right time at the right place. Got it. I, I'm. I would like to add two things. The first thing is I was actually going through an article which said great products will always receive funding. And the second one, the second thing I loved about what you said is you need funding to accelerate your growth, but not to build your business. But don't you think that a lot of startups are raising funds to build their business? there are quite a few, a few of them but again uh, you have to look at the distinction between the first time founders and the uh, mm. repeat founders the 2x 3x founders as we call it so many right. of the times the startups which raise funds to build the products often they are headed by some of these uh, guys who have proved in this proved themselves in the past you know kunal from a first time founder when many of them many of them and mm-hmm. ultimately it's all about having one strategic investor given his name you are able to onboard quite a few other investors right because of the network right so i would i i strongly uh, strongly feel that ultimately get your product in place don't be on the don't be dependent on anybody else to make your product have your mvp ready try to get some traction and then go in for funding yeah before otherwise so it will be difficult for you to raise funds wonderful thank you sir okay so i think this is the end of the investment segment so let's move on to the ashish entrepreneur segment because whatever we spoke about now was completely investing 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 so now let's hear about the struggles of an entrepreneur so ashish is the founder of a startup called ganga so ashish 
Tell us how you started Gang Up and why did you start Gang Up? How did I start Gang Up? Let me uh, share with you a couple of examples, both from my corporate life and personal life, which, which led to the origination of this idea. Okay. Okay. So if you talk about from my first, uh, professional life, okay, uh, I used to manage a team and there was a big, wide, bigger team at play. So very often, you know, uh, we used to have these team events and however large we be the company, uh, budgets are always a constraint in terms of organizing such events, right? So typically right. when you had to organize such team events, uh, normally we call them the khachas, call the junior most people, please see what we can do next Friday to have a team outing mm -hmm. of 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever, right? And I always was passionate about organizing such events uh, because I love doing that. So I also used to participate along with them to see what new could be done. When we tried to do something uh, on these lines, what we found was uh, either you were dependent on the event managers, which who were too expensive, mm -hmm. or right. internet had a lot of fragmented stuff. It had a lot of theoretical stuff. So most of the apps which were there, they were more of one dimensional, right? So every time we had to do something different, we had to come up with our, uh, we had to come up with our own ideas. We had to uh, maybe get some ideas from the internet, but put it to execution, right? So there mm -hmm. was a lot of struggle around that. That was one part of it. Second example from my personal life was, last year was my wife's uh, milestone birthday. And unfortunately that time was okay. the peak of COVID as well. Mm -hmm. So, and she had been looking forward to it for almost a couple of years. Okay. So keeping that mindset in place, we had to do a few get togethers at home, small get togethers, couldn't do large ones. So the idea was given that she had been looking forward to it for two years, how do I make it special for her? And mm -hmm. at the same time, when you have those get togethers, what is the special you can do? You know, everybody does whining and dining at home or yeah. when you get along with friends. What is the extra experience you can create? Right. So in both the examples I gave you, the personal mm. and the professional side, the idea over there was when you get together, what more can you do? What are the sort of experiences you can do? You know, so the idea was, can you look at providing a single digital solution? Okay. Mm. Wherein you could do different types of group activities. Very, very important. Different types of group activities from ideation to execution. Okay. okay. Ideation to execution on the app itself. And which is mm. faster than making your two minute Maggi noodles. Mm. That is how the process okay. started. Okay. Okay. So, mm. uh, and when we looked on the internet, while there were a few apps here and there on the B2C space, there was not much on the B2B side of it. Even there is mm. not much on the B2C. Look. So, what we started doing was keeping that broad vision in mind in terms of having a single app for multiple types of group activities right from right to help you from ideation to execution we started working on uh, gang up we started mm -hmm. uh, in april this year so what we are doing is we are primarily focusing on uh, three verticals within the uh, within these group activity space. The space is pretty huge, but we are focusing on uh, three key activities. One is the social mm -hmm. gaming side of it. Social gaming in a simple parlance is how, uh, any game in which multiple people can play together. So we have a few right. activities on our app around that. Number two, two event what we are also focusing on is, see, somehow we Indians are always very shy to appreciate people. We are always quick to mm -hmm. criticize, but uh, hard to appreciate, right? So the idea was, can we create a bunch of group activities which could help with appreciation and rewards? How do you bring a wow or how do you, uh, you know, make fee people feel appreciated? You know, and it's not that difficult, let me tell you that. So we okay. have a few activities on the app uh, which do help you with the, the, with the appreciation side of it, again from ideation to execution. And to give an example, you know, let's say people have completed five years at work or 10 years at work, or if it's your 40th birthday, 30th birthday, uh, if you have done a fantastic job on some deal. So there could be various scenarios, whether it's on a personal side, professional side. So how do you make people feel appreciated? So there are a bunch of activities we have around. So these two things are live. 
the third thing that we are working on is creating themed events for corporates or online uh, uh, mm. online platforms uh, wherein let's say the football world cup is coming up if you want to have your own event around a football world cup what can we do for you mm. that is that is in the works and we will we should be able to go like with the football world cup so that right. is what we are trying to create a single platform for different types of group activities different kind of audience different kind of interests from ideation to execution at very very minimal budgets so that is mm. what we are doing Interest. So right now, what we have also done is we have got a few clients under our beta launch. So we are doing mm -hmm. our user testing with them. So looking forward okay. to take it to a much wider uh, corporate base in the coming days. Okay. First of all, congratulations and all the best for Gang Up. And uh, this one thing that I've observed. Okay. So whichever entrepreneur I speak with, whichever mentor I speak with, uh, oh. It, especially entrepreneurs, most of their startup ideas are based out of their experiences. So I believe when their startup ideas or the problems that they want to solve are based out of their experiences, they have a strong connect with that idea or with that product. So do you think that maybe this uh, might, you know, uh, what do I say? This might ignite passion in you if the product or the idea is more connected with you or it comes through your experience. Do you think it's a plus point or it adds up a lot of boost to your confidence or something like that? See, I think as an entrepreneur, you should, I think one of the important things what I have learned over the last six to seven months is you should be able to look at it from a bird's eye view as well as a ground zero perspective. So some, mm -hmm. obviously since the idea comes from your experience, uh, it's almost virtually like your baby, right? So Correct. ultimately, while it's your baby and you have to put in a lot of passion, you have to put in a lot of effort. Somewhere you also have to focus that uh, you're not going down a blind alley. That in case things are not working out or if things are not spanning out the way you uh, planned it to be, then you know you should know where to cut your losses. So it's very, Correct. very imp important to be uh, to have a thick skin and be indifferent if the situation demands. Sometimes you should just know when to uh, walk out. Mm -hmm. That's the way I would look at it. Give yourself certain time, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, but mm -hmm. uh, you should know when to walk out if it's not working. Correct. Correct. I think this is actually a lesson for me because I have given myself like 12 months to build my startup. So. As you said, I also have to know when I have to exit. So that's a great advice that I can take away. Also, I am sure as an entrepreneur, you would be facing problems. I am 100% sure. So, so tell me those problems that you are facing. Although you are an investor, as an entrepreneur, what are the problems you are facing? <laughs> I could go on for the rest of the day. <laughs> but if I have to look at the top, a uh, couple of challenges, if I may say, which I have faced over the last six to seven months. <clears throat> Number one, see, coming from a corporate life where you used to manage a team, where you had multiple stakeholders to work with you, the entrepreneur's life is very, very uh, lonely. You know, uh, it's more of a tease. It's more of a, the entrepreneur is more like a C to C, CEO to Chaprasi. Mm. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, I always believe you should not be the smartest person in the room so that there's a potential to learn, but it takes time, you know, because you are the promoter, it takes time, you know, and that leads you to the yeah. second problem in terms, in terms of building the right team or being able to hire the right team. Mm -hmm. On one hand, you leave your six figure, seven figure, eight figure income to come and start this, right? And when... On the other hand, when people, uh, when you are looking at hiring people, sometimes the numbers that you get quoted, they are astronomically huge, right? Mm -hmm. So building a team is not that easy. Not uh, And even if you hire somebody, they may not have the same passion. So okay. uh, because of which, uh, you know, there might be a lot of ifs and buts. So how do you go about building a team, whether it is at a senior level, whether it is at a middle manager or whether it's at a... A junior level is a big, big challenge. If I have to share one personal example, see, uh, 
my experience is more of a more of business related more to do with marketing more to do with business uh, more to do with p2b more to do with fundraising okay the biggest mm-hmm. challenge i had was tech is a very very important parameter of my product okay very very mm-hmm. key component so first three months when i started about when i thought about starting gang up i was looking for a cto to help me out you know mm-hmm. i got numbers from people hey, we want one cr i want two cr oh, wow. okay minimum chahiye so all the numbers kept floating around you know mm. and then the question was it was not possible to hire people at a junior level also because then what happens is i as a entrepreneur may not have the expertise to monitor them on a day to day basis and many of us know how the market in especially in bangalore is booming right everybody mm. has a job for almost every month so you Correct. want to be focused more on your marketing more on your business development more on your funding rather than looking after the employee retention obviously they are important but that is you don't want to be focusing too much of time so so ultimately what we had to do was look uh, look at our outsourced uh, cto model where we got appointed another it company to mm-hmm. work as a part uh, to work as a partner cto for us and they are developing the project mm-hmm. so in that case we okay. had a split project they do the development mm. so well, it may have a few challenges of its own but building a right the point i'm trying to drive home is building the right team which you take so granted in the corporate life is uh, mm. is one of the biggest challenges for me at least right so you have kind of scrutinized yourself from the investor perspective also <laughs> Yes, and ultimately, while you while you are an entrepreneur, it's good not to have people also running for you. Mm. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of people tell that you know finding a team has been really challenging, right? And uh, I think I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and I I think I I can relate to that as well. Although I am building a product that makes collaborations really easy for startups and students, uh, I have faced. the same challenge throughout my entrepreneurial journey first thing was finding the right people and then retaining them oh, that was a huge challenge for me so i can i mean kind of uh, 100% i can relate to you with that well uh, moving on to the next question uh, you are an investor you are also an entrepreneur so how do you deal with the mindset what i try to do is you know i try to be a 90% entrepreneur and 10% investor in terms of dividing okay. my time at least okay and mm-hmm. uh, i think being an investor has also helped me to look at it from both sides of the table in terms of uh, you know just like when an opportunity comes to me how do i look at it similarly uh, you know when i go to somebody for a fundraise it also helps me to look at in terms of uh, how to, how are they going about it that is number 1 number 2 mm-hmm. is Uh, what i have also done is if i have to talk about a personal journey while i while i am there as a founder i have also got uh, aligned with a couple of angels in with syndicates so what happens mm-hmm. is the opportunity whichever comes up gets filtered okay mm-hmm. by uh, by the uh, by the syndicates and there is a certain uh, due diligence which is also done which is very very important so right. uh, you know when you get to learn from many of your uh, co investors who are there on such syndicates in terms of the parameters they look at in terms of some of the mm-hmm. thresholds to uh, look at so that really helps when i go and make uh, my pitch as well okay got right. it also uh, final question to you is okay last two 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 questions uh can you tell us a bit about the startups you have invested in and the sectors they are working in so as i said i have invested in three so far so one mm. is in the uh, pharma uh, space more into women wellness okay. and the second mm. is in the fintech uh, space more in terms of making okay. investing easier uh, making investing easier for people in multiple uh, asset classes and the third okay. one is in the logistics uh, space is what i have put in acha so they are completely diversified just like your stock portfolio is it you know so so far i would have uh, over the last 3 to 4 months that i have been actively doing the angel investing 
So far, I would mm. have won about twenty-five pitches. So, of which these okay. three, uh, these three appeal to me. So, mm. and the founders also appear to have the right mindset and the right uh, uh, and the right focus. So, uh, you know, so th- we went ahead with these three. Yeah, I'm looking to let's say hopefully we'll have some good portfolio over the next ten to twelve months. Right. Are there any sectors that you are specifically focusing on? <clears throat> uh see honestly speaking it's try as of today if you ask me it's more about an individual decision so unlike a corporate mm. there's no fixed criteria as such but ultimately there are more than the sectors it's more about there are certain qualifying criteria in terms of how do you get the connect uh, what is the experience and the mindset of the promoter what is the opportunity uh you know okay. because that, uh, so those are some of the i, I would say the filtering criteria basis which the opportunity gets shortlisted uh, or rejected okay got it okay so final question to you ashish uh, can you give quick tips for founders uh, for investments how do they approach investment investments quick tips you are talking about founders going to invest uh, founders reaching out to investors for money is that what you are saying yeah yes yes uh my view on that would be number one focus on building your network as i said okay. multiple times uh, you know whether it is in terms of uh, being part of some communities so that is the best case scenario as that will invariably lead to uh, one to one referrals for you you will get to learn from experiences from the other ones so that is number one number two is always do a good job as far as your pitch deck is concerned make it more well rounded look at some of the options or some of the guidelines which have been provided by y combinator and quite a few indian uh, accelerators or incubators incubators as well so focus mm-hmm. on that because so that you are able to do a good job and number 3 uh, don't be desperate or don't uh, if i may say don't hound the investors uh, on linkedin that is the worst thing you can do mm. got it is that all i think those would be the first uh, first three things i would say so learn okay. from your experience uh, learn from your experiences try to put together a story uh, how is your st- uh, how can you how is your story scalable from 0 to 1 in a short span of time don't undersell mm-hmm. yourself don't underestimate that is what i would say Super. Thank you. I love the last one. Don't undersell yourself. Don't underestimate yourself. All right. I think uh, this is it for today's podcast. Ashish, is there anything else that you would want to say to our audience? Uh, I can only say that I am a founder as well as an investor, so I can only empathize with you uh, because uh, you know. Uh, many of the challenges that many of you would have faced is something which i also face in my day to day life so don't give up and if you are someone who is contemplating whether to go from uh, uh, from a employee to a founder or not i would only say the journey is very exciting but make sure you have your cash flow for the next 24 months before you take a dive right so bob thank you so much ashish for joining with me on this podcast All right guys this is it for today's podcast i will join you next week on another episode chalo bye 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 ashish thank you